You are listening to The Green Flame, the DGR broadcast that brings you radical analysis, practical skills, and artistic expression from the grassroots to the global. We are your hosts, Max Wilbert and Jennifer Mernan. This week on The Green Flame, we have a conversation between myself, Jennifer, Derek Jensen, and Will Falk about DEW, or Decisive Ecological Warfare, which as you may already know, is the foundational strategy for deep green resistance. Here's that conversation. From Deep Green Resistance, Chapter 15, Our Best Hope, by Lierre Keith. Quote, Fairy tales are more than true, not because they tell us that dra- dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. End quote. G. K. Chesterton. The IRA had Sinn Féin. The abolition movement had the Underground Railroad, Nat Turner and John Brown, and bloody Kansas. The suffragists had organizations that lobbied and educated, and then the militant WSPU that burned down train stations and blew up golf courses. The original American patriots had printers and farmers and weavers of homespun domestic cloth and also sons of liberty who were willing to bodily shut down the court system. The civil rights movement had the redefinition of blackness in the Harlem Renaissance and the stability, dignity, and community spirit of the Pullman porters and then four college students willing to sit down at a lunch counter and face the angry mob. The examples are everywhere across history. A radical movement grows from a culture of resistance, like a seed from soil, and just like soils must have the cradling roots and protective cover of plants, without the actual resistance no community will win justice or human rights against an oppressive system. Our best hope will never lie in individual survivalism, nor does it lie in small groups doing their best to prepare for the worst. Our best and only hope is a resistance movement that is willing to face the scale of the horrors, gather our forces, and fight like hell for all we hold dear. I'm joined today for this conversation about DEW by my co-host, Jennifer Mernan, as well as Derek Jensen, one of the co-founders of Deep Green Resistance and authors of the book that we'll be discussing today, and Will Falk, who we've had on this show before. Thank you all for being here. Glad to be on the show. Thank you for um, being with us for this episode of The Green Flame. Likewise, I'm really happy to be here and really excited to discuss this very important topic. Oh, thank you so much for having me. So DEW is the key strategy promoted by Deep Green Resistance to address the climate crisis, species extinction, toxification, a whole range of the environmental issues we face, as well as a lot of the social issues. Um, It's not a comprehensive strategy in that it doesn't solve every problem that we face, but I know I'm here, and I I think Will and Jennifer are here as well, because we think this is the best available strategy for stopping the destruction of the planet before it's too late. So as you may already know, the, uh, the decisive ecological warfare strategy is laid out in the book Deep Green Resistance, and Jennifer is going to read us the introduction to that chapter. Jennifer? Yes, thank you. At this point in history, there are no good short-term outcomes for global human society. Some are better and some are worse. And in the long term, some are very good. But in the short term, we're in a bind. I'm not going to lie to you. The hour is too late for cheermongering. The only way to find the best outcome is to confront our dire situation head on and not to be diverted by false hopes. Human society, because of civilization specifically, has painted itself into a corner. As a species, we're dependent on the drawdown of finite supplies of oil, soil, and water. Industrial agriculture and annual grain agriculture before that has put us into a vicious pattern of population growth and overshoot. We long ago exceeded carrying capacity, and the workings of civilization are destroying that 
carrying capacity by the second. This is largely the fault of those in power, the wealthiest, the states and corporations, but the consequences and the responsibility for dealing with it fall to the rest of us, including non-humans. Physically, it's not too late for a crash program to limit births, to reduce the population, cut fossil fuel consumption to nil, replace agricultural monocrops with perennial polycultures, end overfishing, and cease industrial encroachment on or destruction of remaining wild areas. There's no physical reason we couldn't start all of these things tomorrow, stop global warming in its tracks, reverse overshoot, reverse erosion, reverse aquifer drawdown, and bring back all the species and biomes currently on the brink. There's no physical reason we couldn't get together and act like adults and fix these problems in the sense that it isn't against the laws of physics. But socially and politically, we know this is a pipe dream. There are material systems of power that make this impossible as long as those systems are still intact. Those in power get too much money and privilege from destroying the planet. We aren't going to save the planet or our own future as a species without a fight. What's realistic? What options are actually available to us and what are the consequences? What follows are three broad and illustrative scenarios, one in which there is no substantive or decisive resistance, one in which there is limited resistance and relatively prolonged collapse, and one in which all-out resistance leads to the immediate collapse of civilization and global industrial infrastructure. At this point, the chapter goes on to describe three scenarios, no resistance, limited resistance, and all-out attacks on infrastructure. And we're advocating that the more resistance there is, the better. So ideally, we want something like this third scenario to play out. Will, can you read this? Yes, I can. In this scenario, militant resistance would have one primary goal, to reduce fossil fuel consumption and hence all ecological damage as immediately and rapidly as possible. A 90% reduction would be the ballpark target. For militants in this scenario, impacts on civilized humans would be secondary. Here's their rationale in a nutshell. Humans aren't going to do anything in time to prevent the planet from being destroyed wholesale. Poor people are too preoccupied by primary emergencies. Rich people benefit from the status quo, and the middle class, rich people by global standards, are too obsessed with their own entitlement and the technological spectacle to do anything. The risk of runaway global warming is immediate. A drop in the human population is inevitable, and fewer people will die if collapse happens sooner. Think of it like this. We know we are in overshoot as a species. That means that a significant portion of the people now alive may have to die before we are back under carrying capacity. And that disparity is growing by the day. Every day, carrying capacity is driven down by hundreds of thousands of humans. And every day, the human population increases by more than 200,000. The people added to the overshoot each day are needless, pointless deaths. Delaying collapse, they argue, is itself a form of mass murder. Furthermore, they would argue, humans are only one species of millions. To kill millions of species for the benefit of one is insane, just as killing millions of people for the benefit of one person would be insane. And since unimpeded ecological collapse would kill off humans anyway, those species will ultimately have died for nothing, and the planet will take millions of years to recover. Therefore, those of us who care about the future of the planet have to dismantle the industrial energy infrastructure as rapidly as possible. We'll all have to deal with the social consequences as best we can. Besides, rapid collapse is ultimately good for humans, even if there is a partial die-off, because at least some people survive. And remember, the people who need the system to come down the most are the rural poor in the majority of the world. The faster the actionists can bring down industrial civilization, the better the prospects for those people and their land bases. 
Regardless, without immediate action, everyone dies. In this scenario, well-organized underground militants would make coordinated attacks on energy infrastructure around the world. These would take whatever tactical form militants could muster, actions against pipelines, power lines, tankers and refineries, perhaps using electromagnetic impulses, EMPs, to do damage. Unlike in the previous scenario, no attempt would be made to keep pace with above-ground activists. The attacks would be as persistent as the militants could manage. Fossil fuel energy availability would decline by 90%. Greenhouse gas emissions would plummet. The industrial economy would come apart. Manufacturing and transportation would halt because of frequent blackouts and tremendously high prices for fossil fuels. Some, perhaps most, governments would institute martial law and rationing. Governments that took an authoritarian route would be especially targeted by militant resistors. Other states would simply fail and fall apart. In theory, with a 90% reduction in fossil fuel availability, there would still be enough to aid basic survival activities like growing food, heating, and cooking. Governments and civil institutions could still attempt a rapid shift to subsistence activities for their populations, but instead, militaries and the very wealthy would attempt to suck up virtually all remaining supplies of energy. In some places, they would succeed in doing so, and widespread hunger would result. In others, people would refuse the authority of those in power. Most existing large-scale institutions would simply collapse, and it would be up to local people to either make a stand for human rights and a better way of life, or give in to authoritarian power. The death rate would increase, but as we have seen in examples from Cuba and Russia, civic order can still hold despite the hardships. What happens next would depend on a number of factors. If the attacks could persist and oil extraction were kept minimal for a prolonged period, industrial civilization would be unlikely to reorganize itself. Well-guarded industrial enclaves would remain, escorting fuel and resources under arms. If martial law succeeded in stopping attacks after the first few waves, something it has been unable to do in, for example, Nigeria, the effects would be uncertain. In the 20th century, industrial societies have recovered from disasters, as Europe did after World War II. But this would be a different situation. For most areas, there would be no outside aid. Populations would no longer be able to outrun the overshoot currently concealed by fossil fuels. That does not mean the effects would be the same everywhere. Rural and traditional populations would be better placed to cope. In most areas, reorganizing an energy-intense industrial civilization would be impossible. Even where existing political organizations persist, consumption would drop. Those in power would be unable to project force over long distances and would have to mostly limit their activities to nearby areas. This means that, for example, tropical biofuel plantations would not be feasible. The same goes for tar sands and mountaintop removal coal mining the construction of new, large-scale infrastructure would simply not be possible. Though the human population would decline, things would look good for virtually every other species. The oceans would begin to recover rapidly. The same goes for damaged wilderness areas. Because greenhouse gas emissions would have been reduced to a tiny fraction of their previous levels, runaway global warming would likely be averted. In fact, returning forests and grasslands would sequester carbon, helping to maintain a livable climate. Nuclear war would be unlikely. Diminished populations and industrial activities would reduce competition between remaining states. Resource limitations would be largely logistical in nature, so escalating resource wars over supplies and resource-rich areas would be pointless. This scenario, too, has its implementation and plausibility caveats. It guarantees a future for both the planet and the human species. This scenario would would save trillions upon trillions upon trillions of living creatures. Yes, it would create hardship for the urban wealthy and poor, though most others would be better off immediately. It would be an understatement to call such a concept unpopular. Although the militants in this scenario would argue that fewer people will die than in the case of runaway global warming or business as usual. 
There is also the question of plausibility. Could enough ecologically motivated militants mobilize to enact this scenario? No doubt for many people, the second, more moderate scenario seems both more appealing and more likely. There is, of course, an infinitude of possible futures we could describe. We will describe one more possible future, a combination of the previous two, in which a resistance movement embarks on a strategy of decisive ecological warfare. Thank you for that, Will. So at this point in the Deep Green Resistance book, the authors go on to outline DEW and what this strategy looks like. They lay out two goals, to disrupt and dismantle industrial civilization and to thereby thereby remove the ability of the powerful to exploit the marginalized and destroy the planet. And secondly, to defend and rebuild just, sustainable, and autonomous human communities, and as part of that, to assist in the recovery of the land. They also lay out a series of five strategies to carry out these goals and how this could actually play out. And I want to point out that in some ways, this material is dated. It was written over a decade ago when fracking, for example, was still in its infancy. And since that time, the U.S. has become the leading oil producer in the world. And predictions about imminent peak oil have proven themselves to be false. Um, I read this quote recently, uh, and every time I think of peak oil, I've been thinking of this quote, Phil Neal said that capitalism doesn't just break, it must be broken. When it seems to be collapsing of its own accord, it is simply reinventing its own technological, geographic, and political basis as new industrial complexes are built and new systems of more extensive government are solidified. So of course, there are going to be errors in here. There are going to be things that were overlooked or were not quite right. But that's okay. These are scenarios. They're thought experiments. And we have to expect that they will contain errors and they won't match reality completely. How could they, of course? So going on from here, I want to open it up and and ask a few group questions. First, Will and Jennifer, do you have any general reflections you want to share about the DEW strategy and why you find it appealing? As a longtime grassroots environmental activist, working with activists through the 90s, I basically all the activists I knew were holding on by their fingernails, trying to protect this or that piece of ground and waiting for the system to collapse because everybody recognized that, that without the system collapsing, the system would continue to grind away until there's nothing left whatsoever. Um, I mean, it doesn't take a cognitive giant to figure out that if there are uncountable salmon and then there are, salmon you can count there's millions and then there's hundreds of thousands and then there's thousands and then there's one fish runs up you know a certain watershed that this is going the wrong direction and everything's going the wrong direction and people recognize this i mean in the 90s um i remember talking to one activist whose mom was not particularly an activist but she was recognizing that there weren't as many birds at the bird feeders as there used to be And that was in the 90s. And I wish things were only as bad now as they were in the 90s. We all recognize that the dominant culture is is committing, is is killing the planet, is is destroying the capacity of the planet to support life. And, you know, all of my work has always been around the question. um, I mean, if, if I had to sum up all of my 25 books, it would be, this way of life will not last forever. And when it's gone, I would prefer that there be more life left rather than less. And so how do you accomplish that? And one way that I've thought about this for decades is if space aliens were coming down from outer space and they were doing everything that the dominant culture is doing, we would know exactly what to do. And DEW really just articulates what we would do. Because what we have to recognize is that this culture has been waging war on the natural world for the last several thousand years. And um, the way, you know, I'm not interested in fighting the good fight. And I'm not interested in, um, in looking back and saying, well, we tried. Um, I'm interested in 
tangible results. I'm interested in there being more wild salmon every year than the year before, more migratory songbirds and more insects and more native species of all kinds. And, you know, I just talked to a guy a couple weeks ago who loves and works with and protects sea turtles. And sea turtles have been around since before the time of the dinosaurs. They have survived mass extinctions and many of them are in trouble. And that is atrocious. And what I'm interested in is not, again, how I feel about resistance and and making myself feel good to get through the day. What I'm interested in is tangible results. And the way that you win a war is by destroying the capacity of your enemy to wage war. You know, World War II was won in part through, of course, the, the Russians destroying the German military. And the other part was the U.S. and British Air Force destroying the German capacity to wage war. And the American Civil War, I mean, wars are not really won or lost on battlefields. That's the most exciting part. But where they're really won is in industrial production. And... You know, the the South was pretty much doomed unless they had some sort of miracle in the American Civil War um, because they didn't have the industrial production. And we can talk about Gettysburg and Vicksburg and all sorts of other battles which were important, but what was really crucial was the blockade and uh, cutting off access to raw materials. So if we start to think, so there's basically two things have to happen. One of them is that we need to switch our loyalty away from the dominant culture and to the natural world. And once you switch your loyalty away from the dominant culture, away from trying to grow the economy, once you no longer – it's like I interviewed this guy a few years ago about the Colorado River. And the Colorado River no longer reaches the ocean. It's more than 100 percent of the river is allocated to agriculture and industry. And I was talking to an advocate for the river. And at one point he said, um, you know, it's really difficult because uh, agriculture in Arizona needs the water. And because this was an interview and because my job as an interviewer is to simply draw people out but not to disagree with them or shut them down, I didn't say no, it doesn't. But but no, it doesn't. And agriculture does not – so, so, so if your loyalty is to the river and not to agriculture, it becomes very simple, that the water needs to stay in the river. And so the first step is to recognize that um, – is to, is, to, is to switch your loyalty away from the dominant culture and to the real physical world that is the source of all life. I was just talking to a friend last night about how we can't believe that people are so stupid as to – have a hard time making their loyalty to the natural world because without a natural world, you have no social system whatsoever. The natural world is the source of all life and it is being destroyed. And, you know, I recognize this also back in the early 90s when when the anti-environmentalists would often say, well, we need to balance the needs of the economy with the needs of the environment. And I would retort to that, wow, so you're even acknowledging in your own rhetoric that the needs of the economy are opposed to the needs of the environment. Well, that's really telling because that, that, that means you understand that the economy is destroying the environment and you can't have an economy that goes against the environment. You have to have an economy that works with the environment. And anyway, so make your loyalty to the natural world is the first step. Second step is to recognize that, that this culture is functionally destroying the planet. It's not just because we need to change a few things around the edges. And the third thing is to recognize that this culture has really been waging war on the planet. I mean, look at it from the perspective of Delta smelt or coho salmon. And and then the next step is to think, so if you really act in the interests of the non-human world, what would you do? What what, what actions do you take? Does that mean you install a whole bunch of new uh, wind harvesting facilities or solar harvesting facilities? No, I don't think so. I mean, the question becomes, if... If Delta smelt could take on human manifestation, what would they do? And the question really is, if Delta smelt could take on human manifestation, how long would the pumps on the Sacramento River last? And and then the, the next step 
is to study history and again to study how wars are won and to okay i'm going to sum this up first um make your log to the natural world second um study history recognize that the dominant culture is destroying everything third um determined to stop it fourth ask yourself how do we stop it how have people stopped uh empires before five um start organizing and working toward that end so that was really how dew developed is is just going through those steps and you know i i am personally just a very not militant person at all um you know, I, I generally uh, shoo mosquitoes away instead of slapping them if I if I have the option, and um, and that doesn't alter the fact that the world's at stake, and the only question that I mean, the only measure by which we're going to be judged by the humans who live a hundred years from now, presuming any are still alive, is by whether they can breathe the air and drink the water and whether the land will support them. They're not going to care how we got there. And, I mean, all of my work is for the non-humans and for the humans will come after. And it's pretty clear once you shift to that perspective, it's really clear what needs to be done. The second question I have for you, Derek, is what reflections do you have on the strategy 10 years after it was written? For example, we were just talking when you showed up about uh, peak oil and how that plays a large role in the in the DGR book, but um, the fracking boom hadn't really taken off when the when the book was being written. And since that time, you know, the U.S. has become the largest oil producer in the world, and that may uh, get, that may crater at some point. People say that the fracking wells are sort of a short term solution, but at this point, it seems like uh, you know, obviously, peak oil has been at least at the very least pushed out uh, further into the future. So. I'm wondering if you have any reflections on uh, the strategy 10 years or more after it was originally formulated. Well, it's even more, it's even more necessary. Um, you know, I wish it would have happened 200 years ago. If it would have happened 150 years ago, um, the people who live on the eastern coast of the United States would still be able to eat passenger pigeons. And if it happened 150 years ago, people in the West could still uh, eat salmon. And uh, every day that time goes on is that much weaker that the world is. And so far as peak oil, I don't. I think this is right in line with 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 all of the peak oil theorizing. That you know, I, I took quite a few classes in mineral economics when I was at the school, Colorado School of Mines. And mineral economics is different than regular economics because it's based on regular economics is you can always buy more dough for your donuts. But mineral economics is really based on non-renewable resources, and, and how does that affect your economics? And the the basic rule, mineral economics can kind of be summed up in you take the easy stuff first. That's it. So if you have oil, first you take the oil you can scoop, and then after that you take the oil that you got to drill for a little bit, and then you take the oil that you got to drill for a lot, then you take the oil you got to drill for offshore, then you take the the fracking. It's it, all of this has a decreased energy return on energy investment, and each of it, all of it has increased expenses and increased environmental expenses. And what fracking really t- says to me is what's been obvious from the beginning anyway, which is that this culture will destroy anything and everything in order to maintain the economy. And, you know, fracking is even more ghastly than, than other forms of oil extraction. And it will do anything, and it will kill anything, and it will kill everything unless it's stopped. And because it will kill everything unless it's stopped, it is up to those of us who, it is up to nature and to those of us who are nature in human form to to stop that from happening. And so my reflections 10 years on are, you know, this culture has continued to get even more insane than it was 10 years ago. And it's one of the things that tracks me up is that you know, in, in Endgame, I wrote, what, between 2001 and 2004, and in there, one of the one of the premises is that 
that the culture itself and most of its members are insane. And I used to say that at talks and everybody would laugh and agree. I, I, I would say, you know, that's premise, whatever number it is. And then I would say, I don't need to talk about this one, do I? And everybody in the audience would laugh and go, no, nah, of course you don't. But I'm still amazed, even though I wrote that, you know, 16 years ago, I'm still dumbstruck every day at how crazy this culture is that, you know, as the world is burning and as, you know, ice caps in Greenland are melting, they are actively looking for mines and getting excited, getting lustful, it's really the word to use, over access to more minerals and access to more oil up up in Greenland. It's just, it's, and in the, the Arctic, it's just, it's, it's, it's a madness. And so, if anything, the last 10 years have merely made me more um, determined and resolute that we need to, 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 move, to move forward with this. I mean, the, the planet is, is – the planet's being killed, and we have one obligation. Thank you for that, Derek. And given that this strategy is so central to DGR – Obviously, there's something about DEW that people find compelling. And I'm curious to hear from uh, Jennifer and then Will about why you find the DEW strategy compelling. Um, I'd like to answer that just simply by saying it's straightforward. And it is as strong and as resolute and as um, wise as, as it needs to be that you can't have any halfway measures um, when when the entire planet is being killed. And that is what appeals to me about it, is that it matches the scale of the destruction and that um, it draws from the lessons of history on how real resistance happens, not halfway measures, not not any of that. So that's my simple answer to that. And I I totally agree with everything Derek and Jennifer just said, I think for my own kind of personal contribution to this, um, to me, one of the, the, the best things about decisive ecological warfare and the plan that it represents is, is the urgency that it embodies. I think one thing that uh, so many environmentalists seem to be obsessed with is how much time do we have left? You know, we see all these articles about, um, you know, 30 years till there's no fish in the ocean or, um, you know, we have 20 years to turn around, run away, uh, climate change, that kind of thing. But for me, you know, we know that there's somewhere around 100 species going extinct every day. Uh, and, and for me, that means that we don't have any time left. That means that Every day that passes, every day that um, goes by where 100 species go extinct um, and we haven't brought this culture um, down is an unspeakable tragedy. In, and every day that passes makes, I guess, our generation um, perhaps more morally reprehensible for not choosing tactics that directly confront this culture and not choosing those tactics that we know will dismantle this culture as soon as possible. So I guess one of the things that I'm most drawn to decisive ecological warfare uh, is, is the urgency. I think that decisive ecological warfare understands the urgency and actually has a tangible solid plan uh, for bringing this culture down as as fast as possible, uh, like all, like everything is is calling for us to do, um, yeah. So for me, it's, it's just really about that urgent and direct action that it's calling for. Thank you, Will, Jennifer, and Derek. I know for my own part, I I actually don't know if I've ever told you this story, Derek, but the f- first time I heard your work was when I went to your talk in Bellingham in 2008 and a friend took me along to this talk. I didn't really have any expectations. I was just happy to see my friend who was visiting me 
and I walked out of the talk shaking because I realized that what you had laid out was a strategy to match the revolutionary ideas that I had already held in my heart for a long time. Um, you know, I grew up in Seattle in this post-WTO era and idolizing the Zapatistas and people fighting back against corporate globalization and fighting against the destruction of the planet and police violence, the occupation of black and brown communities and nations around the world. And I didn't have any outlet for that energy. I didn't see any effective strategies for organizing, for fighting this in a way that seemed reasonable or to match the scope of the problem, as Jennifer said. And your talk helped me shift my mindset. It helped me look at the culture, like you were saying, Derek, from a different perspective and see it as a culture of occupation. And once you have that shift in mindset, then you can look at the technical task of how do you destroy an occupation? How do you fight off an occupy, occupying force when that force is more or less global in scope? And I think that the DEW strategy is probably the most realistic way that I have seen to do that. And I want to share a, a few quotes. Um, there is a document that I was reading recently. It's a thesis from a U.S. Air Force captain looking at sabotage. He did a historical analysis of the effectiveness of sabotage uh, from World War I through Vietnam. And a few quotes that I pulled out of there are, sabotage is an economical form of warfare requiring only a mode of transportation, possibly walking, a properly trained individual, and an applicable sabotage device. The second quote is, history does not point to an effective countermeasure to sabotage. And the final quote is, sabotage has proved itself effective in history. And so when I saw DEW, I think instinctually I understood the same sort of ideas that are being articulated by that Air Force captain, that this is something that's, that's feasible, that's difficult to, to stop. It's something that's, that's doable for a resistance movement with limited resources and limited you know, finances and, and equipment. And it's something that could work. It's worked in the past and it could work in the future. And that's something that I have heard again and again when I've talked to people who are involved in the movement or are sympathetic, who have military background and training in uh, the army or special forces or they say the DEW strategy is essentially sound and it does lay out an effective strategy to bring down the global industrial economy. So does anyone have any closing thoughts they want to share on this DEW topic? Um, yeah, I would like to um, first thank uh, all three of you for your work. And second, I would like to um urge everyone listening to this to join in the struggle, whether you join DGR or not, to join in the struggle on the side of the living, on the side of the planet. The planet needs you, and it is, it is a terrible time to be alive in terms of having to watch the destruction of the planet, but it is also a wonderful time to be alive because we have opportunities to stop this destruction that were not available um, to those 200 years ago. When I mentioned earlier that I wish somebody would have brought down civilization 200 years ago, it wasn't as centralized as it is now. And there are, you know, diversity is, is strength. The natural world knows that. And the dominant culture has replaced real diversity with a very small number of corporations with a very small number of, of increasingly the dominant culture is reliant on fewer and fewer tools. Um, the internet, um, global economy would disappear tomorrow without the internet. Oh, one other thing I want to say, you were, you were, here's, here's one reflection on, on something that has changed and in, in something that was being read earlier by Will there was something about how urban and rural poor may suffer from DEW. But since that time, I have spoken with both Anuradha Mittal and Vandana Shiva about this, that I asked 
Anurad Amitav, former director of Food First, if the people of India would be better off if the global economy disappeared tomorrow. And she laughed and said, of course. And she said, there are former granaries of India that now export dog food and tulips to Europe. And a lot of subsistence farmers have been forced off their land by the global economy. Um, there are, you know, huge lima bean factory farms, factory agriculture in Tanzania that have driven people off their land for export to Europe. And if you stop the global economy, those subsistence farmers will be fine. And then I asked Vandana Shiva, what about the poor people in Mumbai? Will they be better off? And she said, why do you think the poor people live in Mumbai? They live in Mumbai because they've been forced off their land. And if you want instant land reform, get rid of the global forces that are forcing those people off their land and into the cities. And it's the same with immigration. You know, a joke I used to tell for for decades was that I'm actually in favor of closing off the border between the United States and Mexico on one condition, which is that you close it not only to the movement of people, but also to resources. Because if you want to close it to people, but not resources, what you're saying is that I don't want you, but I want the coffee that's grown on land that used to be yours. And so if you stop stealing I mean, that's what DEW is really about. There are, there are millions of, there are billions of people around the planet who right now are suffering because of the industrial infrastructure without receiving the benefits. And if you take away the industrial infrastructure, their lives will be better off immediately. When people say that, oh, bringing down civilization is going to kill a lot of people, first off, they ignore that this is they ignore all the non-human people being killed right now. I mean, they're ignoring the orcas. They're ignoring the coho salmon. They're ignoring everybody else. And they're also ignoring the poor people the world over. They are poor because we are rich. We are rich because they are poor. And, and they're also ignoring everyone in the future. And here's the truth, is that the dominant culture is going to come down at some point anyway. And what I would vastly prefer is for this to be, is for when it does come down, there's more life left on the planet to support other non-human life and to support human life as well. Um, I would like to offer a reflection at the end of this um, conversation about DEW, about something that you said, Derek. And it was about one of the first steps is where's your loyalty? I challenge everyone everyone who's listening to think about is your loyalty to life or is your loyalty to this culture that is destroying the planet and how do your actions match that loyalty or do they do they or don't they i think about that all the time when i think about all the the talk and and, and advocacy that goes on around green technologies and really you're serving the culture you're not serving life so i i ch offer that challenge to myself daily and i'd offer that challenge to all our listeners Okay, great. And if you three are willing, there are a few audience questions here that we actually got submitted via social media. If people want to submit questions for the Green Flame, feel free to send them to any of the ways to contact Deep Green Resistance. Okay, so the first question is, there have been a few articles on dissident blogs, including DGR, about organizing. Now's the time, right? It seems to me that a grand strategy has been made obvious, at least to those looking to contribute towards severe change. The potential for real worldwide change looks good. It's the optimism we need. For those of us that have done reading and studying, we might also be concerned about opportunity. We sure would hate to lose it. It seems to me that opportunity is ripe now. My question, finally, is this. With the rapid advancement of the surveillance state and police technologies, knowing that these advancements will reduce successful actions, should we be more concerned with not missing opportunity rather than wishful thinking that we'll organize into highly efficient cadre? Okay. I think that, um, I think a few things. One of them is I think we need, we need, we need both. We need well-organized groups and we also need groups that are more ad hoc or less, less, uh, less, uh, officially organized. But I often think about Arab Spring and I think about who won an Arab Spring. You know, it was great that they were able to call this, this this uh, this uprising through social media, um, but the real winners were not 
the democratic activists who were able to mobilize on a dime. Instead, the first round in Egypt, for example, was uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, which had been organizing for decades. And then the Muslim Brotherhood lost out to the West, really, and to the, the military um, because they were even better organized. And so I think that the sort of ad hoc searching for opportunities is, is a, a, a fine thing. But I think that we need to use every tool possible, which includes organization, especially when going against you know, the largest entities, largest institutional, largest institutions the world's ever known. And then the other thing I want to say is that, yes, I think that surveillance is ubiquitous, uh, but I don't think we need to give it more power than it, than it, than it really has. And, I mean, the, the, the truth is if the roving eye of Sauron falls on you, then you're kind of screwed. But, but I live in Northern California, and uh, it's been very interesting to live here in the midst of marijuana culture, because even when marijuana was illegal, a lot of people were doing it. At one point, one out of every five houses in Arcata, which is 70 miles south of here, was a grow house. And so on one hand, we, we do need to respect the surveillance state. And on the other hand, I think we need to not give it godlike powers. It is not omnipotent. It's not omniscient. And, and if you have enough resistance, then they can't, you know, I, I think often of Zoya Kosmodemyanskaya, who was a, a Russian partisan in World War II, who was captured by the Germans and then tortured, and she didn't give up anything. Uh, he, the only thing she told them was her name, and she lied and said her name was Tonya. And they hanged her, and her last words were, you can't hang all 170 million of us. And they can't surveil all 200 million of us, and they can't stop all of us. So, and, and so far as opportunities, I think I, I love the line from my locker room when I was in college, um, which is luck, luck is where preparation meets opportunity. And so I think what's really helpful is to be organized, 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 prepared, 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 and be ready to take advantage of any opportunities that you're given. I think that a lot of us are the type of people that spend a lot of time reading and studying history and analyzing, and we have, you know, analytical minds and, and we spend a lot of time thinking about these things. And I'm, I'm definitely one of those people that um, spend more time thinking than I, I do doing sometimes. And I think that one thing that I've, I don't know that I've really been thinking as things just get worse and worse and worse, we're not going to have that perfect plan that we can implement. We're not going to have like a silver bullet to, to save the planet. Um, at a certain point, we're going to have to realize that the perfect plan is the enemy of a good plan. And we're just going to have to start doing stuff in less than ideal uh, situations and less than ideal um, theories and, and plans. Uh, and I just, you know, I always think that there's got to be a certain point where the, the headlines finally just hit home and we're like, you know, at this point, this, we can't take any more and we just got to run with the plan that we've got and we've got to hit it as hard as we can because, because we are running out of time or, or like I said earlier, we've lost time. A hundred species have lost time every day, um, so I guess my main point is, you know, I don't know if there's a right answer to, to the person's question, but I do think that we, sometimes we paralyze ourselves by analyzing our, our theory way too much instead of just realizing that we have a plan and we've got to start enacting it now. Thank you, Will. Jennifer, would you like to add anything? Um, I agree with Derek that the primary um, – purpose is to stop, is to stop the destruction. That as humans, we all long for a place of belonging. We all long for relationship. And we have these toxic relationships to this horribly abusive, destructive culture. It's very fine to think about another culture in another place and to dream that. 
but first the destruction has to end for us to be able to, to go home. Great. Okay, we've got a second question here, which is this. Destroying industrial civilization will de- lead to death, and people in the first world will lose their privileges. What's your strategy to get enough civil support? I could take a stab at responding to this one. So I think Derek, in part, already answered this question. We're already seeing a lot of death under this system, and the reality is that that's only going to accelerate. Collapse isn't something that's occurring in the future. It's something that's happening now. And if you live in you know, a small island nation that's going underwater, or if you live in Bangladesh, or hell, if you live in you know, Paradise, California, and your town gets burned to the ground, or you live in Houston, Texas, and you're underwater from a hurricane, uh, we're already seeing the destruction of, of privilege. We're seeing the destruction of normality, and we're seeing death on a massive scale. Uh, that's only going to continue and accelerate in the future. It's not going to get better because we're deep down this rabbit hole. And, you know, as far as civil support, honestly, I don't think that militant resistance to industrial civilization will ever see a mass level of civil support. I think the best situation that we could see is as the systems that we've come to rely on in the first world for food, for uh, electricity for you know uh, medical care these basic systems of survival as these systems start to crumble and become weaker in the face of climate chaos and economic breakdown and perhaps resistance as well uh, we may see a rising level of support for resistance movements if alternative culture movements like permaculture movements food sovereignty um, you know, those type of movements that are building alternative community level institutions that are really based in democracy and human rights and building an alternative to the capitalist model of profit driven, you know, food distribution and medical care and so on. If we're able to see these systems build and really become a meaningful alternative that can replace the capitalist model as it starts to lose its foothold here and there, uh, then I think those movements could channel people's loyalty towards resistance movements. But, you know, I think that depends on those oppositional movements embracing resistance. Uh, I was at a permaculture conference recently, and I tried to challenge some of the people there to, because I've heard the saying often that permaculture is revolution disguised as gardening. And I think, you know, a disguise is useful in some cases, but it's also a hindrance in other cases. And I, I was trying to argue to these permaculture experts and leaders that that movement should try to be more explicitly revolutionary. Because I think if you take the permaculture principles seriously, you're inherently anti-capitalist. You inherently understand the limits of growth and the destructiveness of industrial society. And building an alternative to that, I think, needs to embrace uh, militant resistance as, as part of that uh, Uh, that future world as part of the transition to a better way of life, recognizing that, you know, we can build our alternatives and our community gardens and permaculture villages, eco villages, all we want. But if we don't simultaneously dismantle the systems that are destroying the planet, uh, it's all, it's all going to be for naught. We're going to have runaway global warming. We're going to have capitalism continue to eat everything across the whole face of the planet. And, you know, there may be a few uh, isolated survival lifeboats that make it a better situation than than others have but we're not going to see the sort of global change we really need unless we can have some sort of merging and melding of those those two movements thank you for that max and i completely agree the 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 only thing i would add is that um if we don't stop industrial civilization not only permaculture but everything we do will be for naught. Absolutely. Thank you. Will or Jennifer, anything to add? I agree with you, Max. I think that circling back around to DEW and understanding that, you know, if you don't get to the root of it and if you don't address that root, then it always is going to be piecemeal. It's always going to be a little bit. And then the structure does what the structure does. The culture does what the culture does. Thank you. So the final question that we have here is from a friend whose name will remain unmentioned. But the question is, what are some examples of effective above-ground action? And can you analyze what made them effective? 
as above ground activists, what principles and practices can we bring into our work that relate to these successes? Anyone want to take a stab at that question? Well, I guess it depends on our definition of successful, but I can think of, um, you know, the creation of the Wilderness Act, um, setting aside of wilderness areas. I can think of, um, you know, I, I think of Brock Evans' line about how the way you make social change is ceaseless. These are ceaseless or endless. Ceaseless pressure ceaselessly applied or endless pressure endlessly applied. Um, and I I think we can, you know, just even though we are we are calling for the end of civilization, I mean, I'm not a reform versus revolution kind of guy. I think the Civil Rights Act was a success. And I think that women gaining the right to vote is a success. I think that women's right to choose is a success. I, I think there are plenty of successes we can point to, and there are plenty of successes we can model ourselves on in terms of above-ground activism. I think that that anybody who is working to, to protect land um, or to protect species is, is doing a good thing. And there is plenty of, th- there are plenty of examples of that. They're not sufficient. It's like the, it's like the old uh, logical statement or statement from logic class. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Thank you, Derek. Jennifer, or Will, do you have any response to that question? One specific area that I think above ground activists or, you know, above ground actionists, uh, a role that they really have in, in something that, um, you know, Derek and Lierre's work in Deep Green Resistance, writing the book, um, this is a perfect example. We really need people to describe, uh, you know, our vision for, for how we're going to win, people to describe that plan um, and do it in very concrete, tangible terms. We really need thinkers that can take the reality of the situation, the urgency of the situation, and translate it into very concrete and tangible steps that um, a movement can take to get there. Um, so I, I would I just would add that to to what Derek already said. Um, you know, we do need people doing the really really difficult research and the really difficult articulation and communication. Um, that can unite a movement and give a movement a, a plan um, to enact. Uh, so th- that's just one area that I see the above ground being really, really needed right now. Thank you for that, Will. Yeah, it, it's a challenging question because, you know, when I think about that question, I really think about the reality that we're losing most struggles around the planet right now. I mean, there have been there have been victories, sure, but if you look at overall, you know, the ruling class uh, is beating the shit out of out of those who are trying to fight back against it. And I mean, that that's not new. It's been something that's been going on for centuries or thousands of years. The, these losses have been progressive and and pervasive, and it's challenging to find a, effective above ground action that you can sort of look at in a broader context and say, you know, because Derek was talking about the Civil Rights Act, for example, and, you know, a lot of those gains are being rolled back. You know, the Voting Rights Act was essentially dismantled a few years ago by the the U.S. Supreme Court. And we're seeing the results of that in terms of gerrymandering and voter disenfranchisement and all this stuff targeting the black community primarily, uh, as well as, you know, other people of color that, you know, that, that's what the, these, these laws and these movements were fighting to, to get rid of, you know, 70 years ago now. And now those, those gains are being dismantled. So I think there's always a constant push and pull and victories are never really secure in this era. I mean, look at the Endangered Species Act, which is being dismantled right now by the Trump administration. And I think the same thing could be said around the world. I mean, there are areas that have been protected as national parks, and then the protection has been taken away. Um, one example is the, the Seven Falls area, which I believe is on the Argentina border. Uh, it was a national park, and it was, uh, it was dissolved for the sake of building this massive hydroelectric dam, which destroyed uh, this beautiful area and, and destroyed this entire river, all to provide cheap electricity to a few 
large corporations in that area. And so it's challenging to find lasting victories. And I think that is one of the that is one of the pivotal factors that I think leads me to support DEW is that uh, it's a plan that could potentially have a more lasting impact as well. Um, it's, it's obviously huge in scale, uh, but you know, when we're talking about the ability to shut down the entire industrial economy, we're talking about dealing a significant blow globally to the ability of the ruling class to do what they do. And, that's not something that we've really been able to see from, from many movements in the past. You said that our, um, you know, these, these victories like Civil Rights Act or Voting Act are temporary. And that reminds me of a famous statement by David Brower about environmental victories, that all of our victories are temporary and all of our losses are permanent. And that's absolutely true. And I guess I would like to just add one thing that all of our losses are temporary and all of our victories, I'm sorry, all of our victories are temporary and all of our losses are permanent so long as civilization continues to stand. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. And just to give a little bit more, uh, a little bit more specific answer to the, to the listener question, she asked uh, what are, what made these above ground successes effective and what principles and practices can we bring into our work? that relate to these successes. And maybe I could just share briefly that recently uh, I published on the DGR News Service the nine principles of war, which come from the U.S. military. And these are obviously designed for warfare, but I think they can be applied to organizing in the above ground. Uh, And so these may be some principles that are sort of general and applicable across a broad range of situations that that could be useful. So I'll just run through these really quick. First one, objective. Direct everything towards clearly defined, decisive, and attainable objectives. Number two is offensive. Seize, retain, and exploit the initiative. Third is mass. Concentrate the effects of your power at the decisive place and time. Fourth is economy of force. Allocate the minimum combat power to secondary efforts. Focus everything where it's most important. Next is maneuver. Place the enemy in a disadvantageous position through the flexible application of your power. Next is unity of command. For every objective, ensure unity of effort under one responsible commander. Next is security. Never permit the enemy to acquire an unexpected advantage. Then comes surprise. Strike the enemy at a time or place in which they are unprepared. And then finally, simplicity. Prepare clear, uncomplicated plans and clear, concise orders to ensure thorough understanding. So, you know, that's sort of some general guidelines. You know, I also think about things like target selection. Um, We talk in our trainings about bottlenecks, the importance of bottlenecks and the importance of finding the right targets so that uh, you can focus your efforts on things that actually matter. And that gets to that first uh, that first principle of war, talking about the objective, focusing on a decisive objective. A poem by Asada Shakur from her book, Asada. If I know anything at all, it's that a wall is just a wall and nothing more at all. It can be broken down. In her autobiography, the black revolutionary Asada Shakur wrote that to win any struggle for liberation, you have to have the way as well as the will, an overall ideology and strategy that stem from a scientific analysis of history and present conditions. Later in that book, she wrote, people think that in order for something to work, it has to be complicated, but a lot of times the opposite is true. We usually reach success by putting the simple truths we know into practice. The basis of any struggle is people coming together to fight against a common enemy. You have been listening to The Green Flame, a Deep Green Resistance podcast. You can find us online at dgrnewsservice.org. You can also find us on iTunes, Google Play, and wherever else you listen to your podcast. Please rate the show and leave us a review. 
Thank you for listening, and until next time.